There we are. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the basic Hebrew lesson for the Bible study Hickory on this 11th day of December 2022. When we left off last week, we were taking a look at Genesis chapter 22, uh, going through the Hebrew text of that particular passage and paying a special attention to the Hebrew verb forms. And so just as kind of a review of the different verb forms before we go back into the text. So as we've seen, there are various components of Hebrew verbs, one of which being the stem, which refers to the type of action. And so we have the cal, nephal, piel, puel, hifiel, hofel, and hifpael. So a total of seven different stems. The cal stem indicates the basic action, the nephal, the passive of the cal, the piel, the intensive action, puel, the passive of the peel, hifiel, causative action, hofel, passive of the hifiel, and hifpael, reflexive action. Then we also have the aspect, which is uh, a reference to the completeness of the action. And there are two primary aspects in Hebrew, one of which being the perfect, which refers to completed action, and the other one being the imperfect, referring to incomplete action. Then we also have the person, which refers to the subject of the verb, whether first person I, second person you, third person he, she, it. Gender, which refers to the gender of the word that is serving as the subject, and that those can be either masculine or feminine. And then we also have the number, which refers to the number of the, of the word that is serving as the subject, either singular or plural. Remember that the dual is absorbed into the plural form when it comes to these verbs. So those are then our different uh, components of Hebrew verbs. And we had also taken a look at this particular paradigm as well for the Cal perfect and imperfect verbs. So uh, that's not the right one. There we are. So thus for the Cal perfect third masculine singular, and again, remember these three X's are a reference to the three letters that serve as the, uh, the consonantal root for the verb. So you have then a, a, third feminine singular, a, 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 second masculine singular, a, a, ta, second feminine singular, a, at, first common singular, a, a, ti, third common plural, a, a, u, third masculine, uh, second masculine plural, a, a, tem, second feminine plural, a, a, ten, first common plural, a, a, nu. So that's for the Cal perfect. And then we also have the Cal imperfect, which would be third masculine singular, yo, third feminine singular, tio, second masculine singular, tio, you tell those apart by context, second feminine singular, tii, first common singular, eo, third masculine plural, yu, third feminine plural, tiona, second masculine plural, tiu, second feminine plural, tiona, and again, you tell the third feminine plural and the second feminine plural apart by context. And the first common plural, nio. So these are going to be the formations of the Cal perfect and the Cal imperfect. Now, the interesting thing is, if you know these forms for the perfect and the imperfect, these forms are the same no matter what stem it is that you're dealing with. So if you know these, you'll be able to identify the person, gender, and number of any perfect or imperfect verb that you come across. But to tell the difference between the stems, the names of the stems themselves tell us how it is that they are formed. And you can see this just by taking a look at this particular document that I have here. So along the side, you can see that we do have the cal, nephal, piel, puel, hifiel, hofel, and the hithpael. So the cal can also be called the paal 
stem as well. So as a result, then, as you come on down here, notice for the pa'al, nifal, pa'al, pu'al, hif'il, hof'al, and hif'pa'al, all of those seven stems have the same three letters, the same consonantal root at its base. And those three letters are going to be the pe, ayan, lameth. So those, in effect, are the three, three X's that I had on my paradigm, in effect. And what then has been added to the stem lets you know what, what it is that has been added to the root lets you know that that is the stem of the verb that you're dealing with. So for the pa'al stem, the cal stem, it's just the three letters of the verb. So thus, nothing has been added. But when you come to the nifal, notice what we have here. What has been added is the noon. So thus, the diagnostic for letting you know that this is going to be a verb of the nifal is that noon there. The pal, notice the pointing. You have the i, a pointing, and normally as well, you would also have that dagesh forte in the middle root letter. We don't have it here because the middle root letter is the ayan, which is a guttural, which cannot take the dagesh forte. Then you have the pu'al, and notice again the pointing here. You have the kibbutz underneath the first letter, and then you have the pathak underneath the second root letter. And again, as the passive of the pial, it as well is going to have that dagash forte in the middle root letter. It does not appear here, again, because the middle root letter is a guttural, and the gutturals cannot take the dagash forte. Hifil. Notice I have those same letters, pe, i, and lameth, but what has been added, we have the he, and then we also have the hiric yod on the second root letter. So those are going to be diagnostics then for the hifil. For the hofal, you again have a he pointed with a kamates hatuf, and that is going to be one of your diagnostics there. Then for the hifpa'il, you have that prefixed hith, and then you would also have a dagash forte in the middle root letter. It's not here in this particular example because, again, the ayan is a guttural and the gutturals can't take the dagash forte. So in other words, if you know the cal perfect and imperfect paradigm, and if you know these diagnostics for the stems, that is, if you know the names of the stems, then you know how all of these perfect and imperfect verb forms are going to be formed. And I can show you that if I come back over here to um, this particular document, which has the paradigms in the back of Pratico Van Pelt, that particular Hebrew book that I showed you all last week. And so thus, notice here, so you can see, Katal, so here they're using the triliteral root, kof, tef, lamet. But when we come on over to the nifal, notice what has been added. The noon has been added. Diagnostic of the noon, of the nifal. Then you come on down here to the peel, and notice we've got that dagash forte in the middle root letter, and we also have the a, -a pointing. For the pu'al, you have that a, -a pointing with the dagash forte in the middle root letter. For the hifil, you have the he on the front with the hiric yod on the second root letter, so thus hiktil. For the hofal, huktal or hoktal, depending, and you can see you basically have the he with the kamets hatuv or in some instances as well the kibbutz, and that is diagnostic then for the hofal. And then you come to the hifpa'el, and you can see that prefix tith. So that's going to be one of those things. If you know the way that the cal perfect and imperfect forms are formed, and if you know the names of the verbs, verb stems, then you'll be able to identify any verb form that you're dealing with. Now, today, I am going to go ahead and introduce something else. I'm going to introduce the formation of the imperative because we're going to be seeing this in Genesis 22 here in just a moment. So formation of the imperative. The imperative is basically a second person command. And so as a second person command, it's only going to use the second person forms. And with it being an imperative, a command that lets me know that it is going to be an action that is not yet 
complete. So thus it's going to be built off of the imperfect. And so you will see then that the imperative, these second person commands, walk, go, that type of thing, these are going to be built off of the imperfect second persons. So thus, in every stem, the Hebrew imperative, the second person command, derives from the forms of the imperfect second person. Thus, the forms of the Cal imperative derive from the Cal imperfect second person forms. These, perfect, these forms are te'o for the second masculine singular, then for the second feminine singular, te'i, second masculine plural, te'u, and second feminine plural, te'ona. To derive the forms of the imperative, the imperfect performatives are removed. So thus, I would just go ahead and come on up here and I would remove these tau's and that would yield then the following forms for the second masculine singular it o for the second feminine singular it e we'll talk about that one in just a moment second masculine plural it u second feminine plural it ona so those then are what we're looking at here but notice especially the second feminine singular and the second masculine plural, where I have i, -i, -i and i, -i -u. In both instances, we have two vocal schwas side by side, which is not a possibility in Hebrew. And so in order to um, rectify that, the first vocal schwa is going to lengthen to the nearest short vowel in pronunciation. And so thus, you can see then, so in the second feminine singular and the second masculine plural, the removal of the imperfect performative results in two vocal schwas standing side by side. Such a construction is not possible in Hebrew and must be resolved by changing the first vocal schwa to the short vowel nearest in pronunciation to the second vocal schwa. This then yields the following forms. So thus for the second masculine singular, it-o, which is the same form we had up above. Then for the second feminine singular, we have it-e. Notice here that the schwa that was underneath the first root letter has now lengthened to the nearest short vowel in pronunciation, that is the hierarch. And then the second masculine plural, we have it-u. Same thing, that lengthening of the, of the vocal schwa. Then for the second feminine plural, Iona. So those then are going to be the forms there. And we will see this as we go through Genesis chapter 22, which is where we're going to be heading now. So thus for Genesis 22, and again, we had gone over uh, verse one last week. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And, and then we're going to go into verse two here. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So let's come on down here. We'll take a look at verse 2 here in the Hebrew text. And let me see if I can make that a little touch bigger here. So there, I think that should be okay. So notice here the Hebrew text of verse 2 in Genesis chapter 22. Wayomer kachna ethabinka eth yehidika asher ahavta eth yitzhak wilek leka el eret hamoria wiha alehu sham leola av ahav peharim asher omar elaka. 
So that then is what we're looking at here. So notice here our very first word, Wyomer. The first thing that I see in taking a look at this is the wow consecutive. That is the wow with the path act followed by a dagesh forte. So thus, I can in fact see that wow consecutive. Remember that the wow consecutive in Hebrew, it will join two uh, clauses together, but it will also indicate sequence as well. That's why we call it the consecutive. Now. When we're dealing with the wow consecutive on a, an imperfect wow with a path back followed by a dogish forte, the dogish forte of that consecutive is going to go inside of the imperfect performative. So thus, I can see that my imperfect performative is the yod that follows. Now, remember, as we're dealing with this, that there are, in fact, four imperfect performatives in Hebrew. You can remember them by the mnemonic device, a thon, where the Aleph would indicate first common singular. The noon would indicate first common plural. So basically the first person imperfect performatives bookend um, our four imperfect performatives. The Yod would indicate third masculine singular or plural. And the tau would, every, would indicate everything else, which would be the second masculine singular and plural, the second feminine singular and plural, and the third feminine singular and plural. In this instance, I'm very clearly dealing with my yod, so that would indicate third masculine singular or plural. To tell the difference, I would go ahead and take a look at the end of the verb to see if I have a U-class vowel. If I have a U-class vowel, I know that this would in fact be plural. Because we don't have that U-class vowel here, I know that this is going to be singular. So thus, I know then that this is going to be an imperfect, third masculine singular. And I can also see the triliteral root here, the aleph, mem, and resh. Now, I'm going to say that this is a cal imperfect third masculine singular of the verb omer, which means to say. And the interesting thing is this does not follow our usual pointing for a cal imperfect third masculine singular where you would have yo. The reason for that being, and I introduced uh, this a little bit last week, but we have the weak consonants. So remember that when we're dealing with a weak consonants, these are going to be consonants where, um, because of the way that they pr are pronounced, they require special pronunciation accommodations. I've referred to it here as a special phonological environment. So, and these weak consonants are going to be the gutturals, the olive, hey, heith, ayan. Then we would also have the noon as well and then the yo, then the well. So thus, where we have the verb omer, it would be what we would call a weak verb because of the fact that it does have one of these consonants, that olive, namely in the first root position. And so as a result then, where that olive is, it's going to require certain changes. And what we have here is in fact the changes that would be required for um, this particular in the, in the cal. And actually I can go ahead and show you that if we come on down here to the first olive or the pay olive. So thus, pay olive, and notice right here is our verb, omer. And then as soon as you come on down to the imperfect, notice, yomer, tomer, tomer, tomeri, omer, Yomeru, Tomarna, Tomeru, Tomarna, and Nomar. So in this particular instance, the pointing has changed underneath the influence of that olive. Completely regular in that respect. So thus, this would be then that Callum perfect third masculine singular of the verb Omer. And as a result, so it is imperfect, but the while consecutive flips the aspect, so I'm going to translate it as though it is in fact perfect. So then he said.
where he is very clearly referring back to God. Now we're going to get into the content of what it is that God said. So here we have then, Kachna Ethbinka. So here you have then Kach. Now this is in fact a Cal imperative second masculine singular from the verb la kach. Now let me just go ahead and illustrate what has happened in this particular instance. So you have then the verb la kach, which basically is the idea of to take or to receive. And then if I come on over here. So la kach, when it goes to the imperfect, so I add the imperfect performative and then the lamev assimilates. So what has happened, if I add, say, the imperfect performative here, I'll use the yod for right now. So thus we would have then y o. So now at this point, the lamev is pointed with a silent schwa, which means it is vowelless. And so what the lamath does in this particular instance is it will go ahead and assimilate and a dagash forte compensative is placed in the following letter. And then underneath the influence of the kaith, which has a tendency to prefer uh, pathax before and underneath it, instead of that holum, we're going to have a pathak there. And that then is why we have these forms Yekach, tikach, tikach, tikhi, ekach, yik, uh, yikhu, and then so forth. So now the imperative is going to be formed off of the second, uh, the second person. So thus, I would remove the tau of those second person forms. So I remove the tau here, I remove the tau there, I remove the tau here, no, no, not there. I would remove the tau here and the tau here, and that would then yield my forms. And so thus, the form kach, you can see then, would be, in fact, the cal imperative second masculine singular, which is what we have here. And thus, I've gone ahead and I've translated it as take. And then we have this interesting word here, na, as well. In the English text, it is translated as now, and so thus we have a tendency to think of it as being an, an adverbial of time, but that's not what this is. This is, in fact, what we would call a particle of entreaty. And so as a result, it's as though uh, the Lord here is saying, please which is kind of an amazing thing to think about. The creator of all that exists saying to the created being, please. And the interesting thing is that's not the only place where this occurs. We can go ahead and come on over here to Isaiah 118. So come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And where the word here is translated as now, you can see that in the Hebrew text, that is the same na. So it's not come now, right this moment. This is come please. So you have then take please, eth binika. So notice here, you can see the second masculine singular pronominal suffix there. And it is on the construct noun bane. So thus, this bane we would translate son of. The second masculine singular pronominal suffix I would translate as you. Now remember that construct nouns are made definite by their absolute. The absolute is definite if it has the article, if it is a pronoun, or if it is a proper name. Our pronominal suffix is a pronoun. It is therefore definite, which then makes son also definite. So take, please, the son of you. 
So this then, we can see by virtue of that definite object marker, this is who Abraham is being commanded to take. He is being commanded to take his son. Well, which son? Eth Yehid Ka. So here you can see that repetition of that definite object marker. So this is, in essence, an appositive to the sun, renaming. And this idea of yahid, this is actually an adjective form of the word echad, which is basically the idea of one. And so you have then that idea of one or only, and then you have eka, that second masculine singular pronominal suffix again. So thus, this yihid is as though saying only one of, then the second masculine singular pronominal suffix, you, which just like above is definite, which in turn makes yihid also definite. So the only one of you. But there's more information. We have a further clarification as to who this only one is. Asher Ahavta. Now, Asher is going to be that relative pronoun, which. And so it is thus introducing a relative clause modifying this. So the only one, which, Ahavta. And so notice the pointing here, Aata, that cal perfect second masculine singular of the verb Aleph, He, Beth, a have, which means to love. So, which you loved. Well, who is this only one of you which you loved? Well, we've got another appositive here. So another appositive, renaming the only one, renaming the son of you, as indicated by that definite object marker, and we have Yitzhak, Isaac. Now, I know the question that you're asking at this particular moment in time. The way that this is translated, the way that we have it here in the text, the text is presenting this as though Isaac is the only one, the only son whom Abraham loved. And that is, in fact, what this text is saying. Now, but we'll clarify that in just a moment. But how can that be? Because we know that Abraham had not only Isaac by this point in time, but Ishmael had also been born. So the question then is, wait a minute, he has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Did Abraham not love Ishmael? And we know that Abraham did, because one, we know that it, uh, it grieved Abraham to go ahead and uh, ask Hagar and Ishmael to leave. And we also know that Abraham interceded on behalf of Ishmael, that Ishmael would in fact live before the Lord. So we know then that there was that, but bear in mind here what has happened. By this point in time, Ishmael and Hagar have already departed, and so only Isaac is there. Which means then, especially when we consider the meaning of the word ahav, love, and I can go ahead and take you to uh, some passages, but basically this idea of love, this is not that emotional affection that we in the States have a tendency to dwell on. Rather, this idea of love is basically giving of oneself to bring about God's design in the life of another. In other words, this is an action. It's not an emotion. It is actively giving of oneself to bring about God's best, to bring about God's design in the life of another. 
Ishmael has already departed. He's far from where Abraham is at this moment, but Isaac is still right there, which means then that Isaac is the son in whom Abraham has the opportunity to invest and to actively give up himself. And so thus, Isaac is the one that he has the opportunity to actively give of himself to. And so that's what that's kind of what this is pointing out here. So take, please, the son of you, the only one of you which you loved, Isaac. And then what are they to do? Wilek leka el eretz hamoria. So here again, you can see that we do have this wow conjunction. It is joining the kach and the wulek here. Now, this wulek comes from the verb halak. This is another one of those imperatives that we were talking about earlier. So you have then halak. When halak goes to the imperfect, it becomes Telik, there. And then, in order to form the imperative, I would then go ahead and remove the imperfect performative, thus yielding lake. And thus, thus you have ulak here. And take, leka, notice the lameth preposition there with the second masculine singular pronominal suffix, to you. L, there we have another preposition, unto. And then I have Eretz here. So Eretz, that's going to be the idea of earth or land. It is followed by another noun here. So that tells me that I've got a pretty good chance of Eretz being in the construct form here. So land of Hamoria, that it would be, you can see, hey, with the pathak followed by a daga forte there. That would be the article on the word Moria. And so thus the Moria. And with that absolute then being definite, that would in turn make uh, Eretz also definite. So, and take to you or take for you, go. No, that's not, oh, okay. Sorry, Halak has the idea of to go there. That's not take, that's going to be the idea of go. So, and go to you unto the land of the Moria. And then we have here, Waha alehu sham. Notice here you've got another one of those conjunctions. I have here the uh, verb, the ayan, lameth, and there would be another hey here. And that would tell me that this is from the verb Allah. And then I can also see the hey of the hithil on the front of it. But the shortened vowel here, the reduced vowel all the way down to the composite schwa, that tells me that this is going to be um, one of those Im imperatives. Because remember, those imperatives have a tendency to begin with that schwa there. And then I have as well the ehu, which would be the third masculine singular pronominal suffix. So thus we would say then, and cause to go up, go up is the idea of Allah there, him. And then we have sham, which is the adverb there. But in what way? Leola, this is going to be a cal infinitive construct. Um, more on the infinitive construct later. But you can see there's a lameth and then the ola there. So basically to a going up offering. Uh, so thus you do have that noun idea. Uh, they've taken that verbal idea, they've turned it into a substantive. And then you have al, upon, akav, one of, heharim. And you can see here, you have the word har, mountain, with the im, masculine, plural. And then I have the article on the front of it, the mountains, which in turn makes ahad definite as well. So, and cause to go up him there, to a going up offering upon the one of the mountains, asher, there's that relative again, which, modifying the idea of the mountains there, omar, 
and you can see once again the triliteral root Aleph, Mem, Resh. I put an Aleph on the front of it for the first common singular. And as a result, then you would have Omer. But because I would have had those two olives side by side, those two olives are going to join together. And so as a result, then we would have Omer. And that would be then I will say. And then we have Elika. And you can see we have the preposition L with the second masculine singular pronominal suffix you and thus unto you. So again, going through all of this, you can see, then he said, take please the son of you, the only one of you which you loved, Isaac, and go to or for you unto the land of the Moria, and cause to go up him there as, as a going up offering upon the one of the mountains, which I will say unto you. And then next week we can get into uh, verse three. Um, but uh, sir, is there anything that you would like to add to this? Um, hmm. <laughs> That's the wrong question. <laughs> uh, but no, I actually I got sidetracked. And I was over looking at, at something in um, Gerhardt's boss <laughs> mm -hmm. and trying to put something down here. No, I think that that was good. I, I heard what you said, but I just, it's, um, let's see. I think, I think we'll leave it at that, if that's all right with you. Sounds good. So I'll go ahead and any questions from anyone else before we go into the main part of this? Yeah, go ahead. You let them. Any comments or questions from any of you? Anything you'd like clarified with respect to Hebrew? Of course, I have a question for you. Is Hebrew theological? Hmm. I would say most definitely. Now, now, okay, now I got to ask you, why do you think that Hebrew is, well, you don't think Hebrew is theological, you know the Hebrew is theological, so why do you know Hebrew is theological? <laughs> because it is the language that the Lord chose. Oh. to express himself and to build into his Adam, which means then that it that Hebrew says things in exactly the way that the Lord intended things to be communicated. Mm. And you don't think English does a better job? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all, for English sure. English is a derived language of a derived language. Of a derived language, yes. <laughs> <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but okay, yeah, that'll be good. So, if you want to close up there, if they don't have anything, all right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.